What's up, everybody? This is week 13 to 14 of the Pregnancy Podcast slash kind of a recap and answering some of the questions that I got from you guys on Instagram about my first trimester. So basically at 14 weeks, and I don't know the exact day, there's probably an exact day in between 13 and 15 weeks that you're officially out of the first trimester, but 14 weeks, I've made it out of the first trimester. That means I've lived through two first trimesters in their entirety at this point. And um, instead of just doing the weekly recap that I would do from what I can remember, a recap of this current first trimester that we just got out of and my last one, how they were different, how they were the same and answer some questions. So um, it's, and what I mean by what I can remember is I think that there is definitely like a safety mechanism for mankind that we don't remember <laughs> all of it. And I mean, I can't even remember what I did a week ago today or or how I was feeling and you just kind of keep going through. Um, there's a lot of things with Knox's, uh, the pregnancy with Knox that I don't remember. Um, I'm positive that I don't recall exactly how difficult the birth was and stuff like that. But I made some notes since it is still pretty fresh with this one. And I do remember some things with Knox's too. And I did I did journal a little bit with Knox um, pregnancy. That was almost three years ago, I guess. Um, so I've had some time. But uh, the, I, I took some notes here. I want to make sure that I went over all the key phrases that I think of <laughs> in my experience with living through the first trimester, not just once, but twice. So the number one way that I would describe, like if I had to describe a f the, your first trimester in one word, it would be exhausted. Um, and that was true 100% for both times. Um, so much so that like, even though now I'm still not getting the best sleep and I'm still very busy, even just like, two weeks removed from when it was really bad, it's a huge difference. Like right now it's about a uh, three o'clock here when we're recording this and I would be dying to go to sleep. And right now I feel okay. I'll usually won't get that tired until like six or 7 PM now, but two weeks ago, 1 30 PM hit. And it was the same way with Knox. And this is like, an exhaustion that you can't explain to someone else. And this is coming from somebody who I used to travel for work to uh, not just like different time zones in the US, but all over the world. Like I would fly from Utah to Australia and then have to wake up the next morning and, and coach all day long. And that was always like, I was always super exhausted from the travel and the time change. That wasn't even close to what just like a normal day was in the first trimester of exhaustion. So. I would say that's the most similar experience that I've had is having like some really crazy travel and time change and still having to get up the next day is probably the closest that I've felt, but still not quite the same. Um, the only times I've ever felt like literally in danger driving, like I'm going to fall asleep driving is during the first trimester of both pregnancies. And I'm not talking like a four hour drive. I'm talking like 20 minutes home from work or something like that both times. Um, it's just crazy. And no matter how much sleep you get, it doesn't matter um, because people would be like, oh, you know, just try to get more sleep or try to take naps, which was is great, but it didn't really necessarily help. It felt good if I would do that kind of stuff, but it didn't really help. Um, wasn't able to actually take a, too many naps. I took more naps this time than I did with Knox, actually, I think. Um, I was a little bit more hard-headed when I was pregnant with Knox and... Um, just naps were something that didn't occur to me in my life at that time. Um, even though I would say I'm definitely busier now, uh, I did end up having to take a few more naps. And I think Julian w was a little bit, not that he wasn't understanding the first time, but he was a little bit more helpful this time because he had seen it before too um, and forced me to take a couple more naps. But all in all, I maybe took like six or seven total through the whole 14 weeks. So... Number one way I would uh, describe it is definitely just exhausted. The number two thing that you deal with a lot, at least like on my list of when I was 
listing out what first came to mind is just being in constant like fear or worry. Um, and this was much stronger this time for me than it was the first time because I had a miscarriage in January and, uh, this was a pregnancy that we had been working on and trying to make happen for like nine months. Um, you're constantly worried that, I mean, you can't really feel the baby kicking yet. And for the first, like, I found out I was pregnant with Knox, I think, or with this new one, I think at like four weeks because we were trying. So I took a test. Um, and it was like a solid two weeks before we could even go try to get like an ultrasound or anything like that. And then another like four weeks before we could get any other testing. So those times in between, especially if you've suffered a miscarriage, are are full of worry and fear and um, is everything okay? Uh, is the baby still growing? Has it been able to attach? Um, is everything fine? Is it going to have a heartbeat? Is it going to have any problems with the blood markers? Um, did I work out too hard? Did I drink too much coffee? Did I eat something bad? Did I, you know, and um, there's so many people who they don't find out they're pregnant until they're like nine, 10 weeks or more. And I can't even imagine how those people replay what they had done in their lives before that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of fear and a lot of worry. And I know um, for many people, I don't have this situation as badly, but accompanied with the fear and the worry is like a secretiveness that a lot of people keep. Um, I, we let our staff know pretty soon after I found out that I was pregnant. Um, and so the people in my life have known about it. And so there, it wasn't like a big secret, but I have some close friends who are also pregnant right now, not too far either further along than me or behind me, who chose to keep it a secret for pretty much their entire first trimester and go to regular jobs and work their regular jobs and everything with all this exhaustion and all this fear and anxiety that they're feeling and keeping it a total secret. So I voiced why I think that that should change in our society. I don't think, I don't blame people for doing it, but I just think maybe it's something that would be better if we changed our ideas around that because you're going through so much that even just having one supportive person at, at work that knows or if your boss knows or something like that, and they can be supportive of you during that time, um, I think that you would actually end up being more productive at your job and just able to be more at ease um, because it just heightens everything when it's a secret. Um, but even though it wasn't a secret for me, the third word that I did write down was uh, lonely. Um, you're the only one that really knows what you're going through and there's so much added to your plate even if it's just things that are on your mind when you're pregnant and even with a super supportive partner and I've talked about this a lot Julian's so super supportive he he doesn't he, he'll never be able to fully understand what it feels like and what the hormones do to your like anxiety levels and how all of the all of the pressure is kind of on you. And it feels like, even though there's so many things that can happen in our pregnancies, or especially early pregnancies, um, that can cause miscarriage or whatever, that are not our fault at all. There's nothing that we could have done to prevent it. Everything feels like it's our responsibility and everything feels like if something goes wrong or something happens, that it's your fault. And so this pressure to like, do everything perfectly um, and and while you're so exhausted and, and everything is, is really tough, which is probably why I get so many questions because people want to know, they're like, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I eat this? Can I eat that? Why can't I sleep? What, what can I take? What, you know, and, and all this stuff um, from s complete strangers, I get so many questions, which I'll answer the more common ones here in just a minute, but it's, it's a very lonely feeling. Um, and I think just with, your emotions are crazy heightened. Um, that's actually the one of the words that I wrote is just emotional. We're emotional when we're tired regardless. So that happens. Um, so you're exhausted. And I don't know about you guys, but when I'm tired, whatever emotion I'm feeling is like tripled, maybe even more. Um, but then your hormones jump on top of that and they triple it again. And it's just very much highs and lows. One of the words that I wrote was, 
you're excited. Obviously, um, if you're trying to get pregnant, you're so, so pumped and excited and just like you start like, is it going to be a boy or a girl? What should we name the baby? I mean, I spent so many random hours way too late at night researching baby names because you just get so excited and then it's like you want to tell everybody and you want to talk about it all the time and and it's all you can think about is the baby and your belly and all this stuff and um so obviously it's really exciting at the same time you're terrified of like being too excited because something could happen and really I mean people suffer from loss at all stages of pregnancy um I know People in our community who have lost babies just days before they were due um, and people who have lost babies within hours after they were born. Um, So it's not like once you get out of the first trimester, you don't have to worry about it at all. But the most common time to lose a pregnancy is during that first trimester. So um, you're so excited, but kind of so nervous and scared at the same time. Um, And then the last word that I wrote, I think it's the last one. I have two more thoughts before I get into your questions. Um, I wrote nauseous. I didn't really have a lot of nausea with Knox. Um, Not that I remember too much. And I, even with this pregnancy, I never threw up. So, and I've I've talked to people that are like, uh, that's actually worse because typically when I would get nauseous, I would throw up and then I would feel better. Um, So maybe... Maybe that's not better than I never threw up, but I did never throw up with either pregnancy. Um, I did. I was way more nauseous with this one, which is why so many people were DMing me telling me it was going to be a girl. It is not a girl. Um, but uh, yeah, and that just adds again to like if you're already exhausted and you're emotional and now you're like sick, it's just not the first trimester. They, they say it's the hardest part of pregnancy for several reasons. And all of that combined with pretty much no one knowing that you're pregnant is just, it's just tough. So um, I was nauseous, way more nauseous this time. I know people get it way worse than I did. Um, But it's just something that you got to be ready for. And not everybody will have that go away. But most people do have it go away once they get out of the first trimester. I've heard some horror stories of people who were sick the whole time. And I can't even imagine that. But um, all of it passes. So... For, for the most part, okay? So for me, the exhaustion is getting better. The nauseousness is gone. I had a lot of headaches that I'm not really having anymore. There will be things that come in at their place, like the round ligament pain that I'm having or the, now or the pubic bone pain have, that I'm having now or just uh, my low back has started getting tight. Um, your hips are going to, my hips are going to start getting uncomfortable. So there's stages, but just kind of remembering that it's just a stage and that it will pass has helped me. The only other thing that I wrote that I remember this with Knox and it it was maybe even more true this time. I showed a lot sooner with this pregnancy, which is uh, which is common in your second pregnancy because everything's already been stretched out and your body kind of knows what to do. Um, But I remember feeling the entire first trimester with Knox and this pregnancy as well is that you don't really to a stranger, to anyone that doesn't know you're pregnant, you don't really look like a pregnant person in your first trimester. You just look like you're you're gaining weight and you kind of look like maybe you've been like hitting the, I don't know, Starbucks breakfast sandwiches too hard. (laughs) And so you're emotional, you look tired, which by the way, if you're luckier than me, you won't have people DMing me, DMing you, telling you that you look tired. You're emotional, you look tired, you're nauseous, and you feel fat. Like that's the, and it's all a secret. That's the combination. That is the first trimester. Um, In a nutshell, it is such a blessing and a gift. And once again, if having babies wasn't so incredible and life-changing and just worth it, none of us would do this over and over again to ourselves um, because it's it's a lot. Um, I've always said that, the nine months of pregnancy and the trials that you go through um, are the price you pay to have the honor of being a mom. You have to go through such struggle and hardship, I believe, because it changes you as a person. If you were just you one day and then the next day were handed a baby, I mean, people people do that. But even I won't get into like the adoption process. And I do believe in that stuff, by the way. But we're talking about pregnancy. You just 
you kind of have to earn it almost. Um, and going through the pregnancy and learning about yourself and really learning like you're not in control, like this stuff is happening to your body and you can try different essential oils and you can try different supplements and this and that, but it's going to be hard. And just accepting it, I think is such a great precursor to um, becoming a mom. So we made it through and um, uh, I'm feeling pretty good now. And the second trimester is usually where people feel the best. So hopefully for the next 14 weeks, I'll feel pretty good and just be able to share with you guys when I can feel the baby kicking a little bit more and doctor's visits. And we got a bunch of travel going up in the holidays during this trimester. So it's going to be good. Um, I did write down some questions. So earlier on my Instagram today, I asked what questions you guys have because I get so many messages, people asking me stuff um, about how I was in the first trimester or things that I did. Now, keep in mind, and I say this on every single post, I am not a doctor. So when I say what I did, that's not me suggesting to you what you should do or saying that it's the best way or anything like that. Every pregnancy is very different and very personal. And what you were doing before, your fitness level before, how you were eating before, what your what complications you do or don't have in your pregnancy, all of that stuff plays a role in what's appropriate for you in your pregnancy. So uh, just keep that in mind. But I'm going to answer the questions, the most common ones that I got on my Instagram. So there's a lot of questions on there, and I do get this question a lot. Um about being motivated despite being so fatigued and being so nauseous for your workouts. So how are you able to stay motivated even though you're so fatigued and so nauseous in your workouts? For me, motivation to work out, it doesn't exist. And I've done posts about this before. There's no motivation to work out even when I'm not pregnant. It's just a habit. It's part of what I do. That would be like me asking you, what was your motivation to go to work while you were pregnant? Like, I just can't get myself to go. And it's like, well, no, it's just, I mean, for your job, you, you kind of have to go because it's how you make money and you're going to need that for raising this little baby. And it's just part of your day. Like, yeah, you might call in a sick day here and there, but at the end of the day, like, you just, you got to do it. Um, there's no motivation to take a shower or brush your teeth other than that it's just good for you and it's healthy. That is working out for me. So I don't really have to find motivation to work out. And that's been true for pregnancies, non-pregnancies, injuries, all of that. My biggest um, recommendation for that is to not wait for yourself to be motivated, but to just um, decide that you're going to do it. And some days I would feel great and work out and um, feel awesome even beforehand and feel great while I was doing it. Some days it was like, I don't want to be doing this at all. Um, I would say 90% of the time when that was the attitude going in, I still ended up feeling pretty good within like five minutes of the workout. And some days I would be doing the workout and I'd be like, you know what? Hmm. I'm just going to mail this one in and maybe even cut it short or not time myself or whatever. Um, but yeah, I was, I would say the biggest key there is don't look from, you're not going to be, you're not going to be motivated to do anything when you're this exhausted. So you just have to decide what you want to do and what your goals are and try to stick to that as close as possible. And don't expect to be motivated because that's where you're really going to fail is when you're waiting to, for the day <laughs> that you really feel motivated. Those days are going to be few and far between. Uh, the next question I had is, okay, so how often did you miss workouts? Um, I, again, because I don't really, it's just part of my day. I maybe missed, I want to say three or four workout days where I would normally have worked out and I didn't. Um, because I was, I decided a nap was more important or I just was too tired. Um, so out of the 14 weeks, maybe three or four days wide normally, I work out typically three days in a row, then one day rest, and the, then either two or three days in a row again. That's kind of like the way that I go. Typically, I don't work out on Thursdays and Sundays. Um, not always, but that's like a pretty normal schedule for me. And there were maybe like three or four days during the 14 weeks that that was not the case. 
with that said, once again, I'm not saying that that's what you need to do. I'm just telling, I'm answering your questions that that's what I did. Um, another workout question that I get a lot is how are you managing your intensity and your heart rate? I get questions a lot about like, do I need to slow down? Do I need to use less weight? Do I need to, I mean, I get the craziest questions. I get people asking me if it's okay if they wear a weight vest, if it's okay if they do a competition, if they, if I think they should do the open and all of this. And it's like, I know what they're doing. They want me to tell them to do what it is. Whatever it is they, they want to hear is what they're hoping that I'm going to say because their doctor doesn't know what any of that means. So the doctor's for sure just going to say probably don't do it. So they're wanting me to say, yeah, do the open, crush it, or yeah, sign up for the competition. It's all very personal. Um, as far as what I do for intensity and heart rate is, and I've actually been doing this for the last... I guess like 11 months now, since January, we decided we wanted to get pregnant. I lowered my intensity to where I can hold a conversation during the workout. If you come up to me during the workout and say, what number are you on? I can tell you without it being like a completely breathless, I'm about to black out answer. Um, I can talk to Knox when he's running around and I do not have to lay down at the end of the workout. I can immediately go and walk a 400 meter and, um, Sometimes I actually feel rude because a lot of our staff will still be working out when I finish and I just like take off, which is not the best like team workout etiquette. Usually you stick around and tell each other your job, but I have a habit of just walking 400 meters, coming back, slow my heart rate a little bit, um, where normally because I had competed for so long, I will go much harder than that in workouts. So I know a lot of doctors will suggest specific heart rates, um, which... I understand why they're saying that, but it all depends on your fitness level when you got pregnant. So um, for some people, walking up a flight of stairs can jack their heart rate up and they can't hold a conversation where other people could be doing a pretty, you know, what looks like a high intensity workout, like a street parking workout or something and still be totally fine. It all depends on where you started. So I, um, I really like to use, instead of like measuring my heart rate or anything like that, just the ability to talk, the ability to breathe and the, the not needing to lay down. I take a lot more breaks, um, in the workouts now. One thing that I do feel like I actually gained when I was pregnant with Knox is the ability to pace because I'm not, I, before I was like known as the, like, I'll always win the first round person in the workout. And, um, so pacing, actually is something you can practice when you're pregnant. And I think it's something great to practice and will just make you more fit in the long run later. So that's how I manage the intensity. So like people asking me about competitions or the open, if you can go to a competition and not care how you place and just have fun, fantastic. If you're not capable of doing that and you, as soon as you're in that setting, will go 100% and get to where you can't talk and you're blacked out on the floor afterwards while you're pregnant, probably not a good, not a good idea. So it depends on the person and, and what your approach is going to be for that. Um, food questions I get a lot, obviously. Uh, have you been able to eat healthy? Um, I don't know what this specific person thinks of as healthy eating. Um, for the most part, and this is very well documented. If you guys watch the vlogs, um, I show a lot of my meals. Um, for the most part, I eat the same as what I ate before. Um, with Knox, I ate exactly the same as I ate before because I was training a lot harder going into being pregnant with Knox. This time, I do add some treats here and there. Um, uh, I've definitely eaten out a few more times than I normally would. I had the Starbucks breakfast sandwich day. That only happened once. I've had a couple like bagel sandwiches. Julian and I usually had pizza once a week even before I was pregnant. Um... But for the most part, I still eat every day for breakfast, uh, oatmeal, egg whites, blueberries, almond butter, banana every day. There's maybe been two or three days where that hasn't happened, like the French toast day, which is on the vlog. Um, for lunch, I either eat at a place here called Freshy, which is like a rice bowl, broccoli, avocado, chicken thing. Um, it's super clean. Or... Every once in a while, I'll go get Chipotle. I would say like maybe once every two weeks. With Knox, I eat Chipotle every day. 
every day for lunch. <laughs> so that's actually cleaner this time. Um, for dinner, a, a, a lot of times for lunch too, I'll eat the same thing that I eat for dinner at home, which is either rice or sweet potatoes, some sort of like ground turkey or meat, veggies, avocado. Um, I'll have like a couple pieces of chocolate. I'll have some chips and hummus here and there. Like once a week, we'll have pizza. Uh, I think I've had a couple like sandwiches and burgers and things, but for the most part, I mean, I think I'm eating pretty healthy. Most people would probably see the things that I refer to as cheats, like my bagel sandwiches, and not really think of those as too bad. So um, I know that a lot of the questions are like, but how are you doing that? Because all I want to eat are burritos. All I want to eat are carbs, like bread and stuff like that. Um I think a lot of that, once again, comes down to habit for me. Like, it's just, I don't th overthink eating too, too much. Um, I have had a couple cravings, which I filmed on the vlog, like the day where I went and got the two Starbucks breakfast sandwiches. I've randomly gone and gotten like a cookie and things like that. But I don't think about food too much more than just like needing to eat as fuel. Um, I didn't have any food aversions. So I got lucky that way. I know a lot of people will be like, I cannot even look at eggs or I cannot even look at chicken. And I feel for those people. Um, when that stuff happens, just do the best that you can and know that it will pass. So don't be too hard on yourself if for a couple weeks, all you can eat are peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Like try to get some good protein in there. Try to scarf some things down. But even if you can't, it will pass. And just as soon as it passes, try to get back onto it and don't let that become like the new norm just because it's tasty, I would say. It's probably the best advice there. Um, a lot of people have a hard time eating, eating at all because they're so nauseous. So try some liquid stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't had that problem. So luckily, but that's, yes, I've, mo I've mostly been able to eat healthy. <clears throat> I've had a couple questions about how did I stay... Um, calm while waiting for the results from tests or waiting for the first ultrasound or waiting even for the positive pregnancy test. Like how do you, so while trying to get pregnant, I did get into a, a pretty bad way of um, taking tests like eight days before my period and taking a test every single day and um, being really bummed out when they were negative. Uh, so I would say like a month or two before I actually got a positive test, I stopped doing that and I stopped taking tests. And we kind of talked about like, hey, let's not tr keep trying, but let's not like not try. Cause I was like mapping the cycle and everything. And we were trying to like, you know, schedule everything. And it was just causing me way too much stress and anxiety. And then of course I felt like it, I did something wrong every single time I got a negative test. So. We had kind of cut that out and chilled out on that a little bit when I finally did get a positive test. When I got a positive test, it was right after we got back from vacation and um, could have maybe taken a test before we left, but waited until we got back so that I didn't, I wasn't either bummed or, you know, anything like that. And and I do think that relaxing on some of that a little bit is, is what helped. And you've heard that story a million times. My version of that is like one of millions, I'm sure, that are out there. Because um, you hear so much like, hey, as soon as you stop trying, that's when you get pregnant, right? So um, I don't really have good advice for waiting for the results from like blood tests and things like that because I'm really bad about that kind of stuff. I was really anxious. I was really worried. I was Googling everything that you shouldn't Google, like the different, like the chances of, down syndrome or the chances of this condition or that condition based on my age and based off of my family history, like everything. I was 1 a.m. like reading this like stuff and people having like miscarriages. I just, I'm really bad at that. So I actually don't have good advice. Julian was really good at bringing me back to like present day and what that none of that stuff has been, we have not been told that any of that is an issue with us. And so until it has happened, to just not worry about it. He's so much better about that than I am where I'm like, well, I want to prepare myself for all these potential problems. But he's more of a like, hey, let's actually like deal with the problem if it actually comes up. And so um, 
I would say talking to somebody about it so that you can find somebody who's a little bit more rational than your tired, emotional, hormonal, (laughs) nauseous state is at this time. And maybe somebody who's been through it because you start to really like go down a rabbit hole of like, for sure, everything's going to be wrong. Um, And it could be like you could get some results that you're not um, wanting. Uh, And if you Google it, it will seem as though everyone who's ever been pregnant has had these issues because there's just so many stories of it. But the truth is there are billions of people walking this earth that are very healthy and were born very healthy. um, And it happens Every day. So uh, trying not to worry about it, I would say. But I was really bad at it, so I don't have the best advice there. People ask um, about how I've added birth fit to my training. And and I get constant requests for specific scales. Uh, I have my kind of go-to scales. Once again, it's going to be highly dependent on what your fitness level was before you got pregnant. Um, and also what stage of your pregnancy that you're in. Like I get asked, I'm not kidding, at least five times a day, when do I need to take out pull-ups? When do I need to take out toast bar? When should I stop sit-ups? When should I stop running? When should I stop doing double-unders? Um, I'm first of all, not qualified to give you that kind of information based on the fact that I've been pregnant twice and gotten advice from other people, but I'm not personally educated in all of that stuff for just the general population. So I can tell you this, with Knox, I was able to do things like toes to bar and pull-ups and stuff much longer without any signs of um, like the coning that I've shown also in the vlog and things like that because I had never been pregnant before. So the structures were much stronger. Um, I could do double on, I could still do double auditors probably now, but I know that I can change the workout to be just as effective without them for the next year or so. And so I just, I kind of have this mentality this time. It's like, yeah, I could do that. I could do this. I could do that. But like, why? I don't need to. I can still stay very fit without doing those specific movements. So um, the movements eventually at some point in your pregnancy that you're probably going to want to take out. Again, I would refer to a company or somebody like BirthFit, a coach that knows about this stuff to ask more questions. Hanging from the pull-up bar, that's a really big stretch on the midline, especially once you start kipping and doing toes to bar and stuff like that. It really stretches the abs every time you do that forward swing of the kip. So eventually that's probably going to, you're probably going to want to take that out. You will be physically capable of doing kipping pull-ups your entire pregnancy if you can do them now. It's probably not, I know it's not necessary and you probably will want to take it out if you're trying to be smart. Um, even going overhead, um, a lot of times when we start to lose our ability to keep our belly tight and keep the rib cage pulled down, um, going overhead with the barbell might be better suited with dumbbells that you can keep out in front a little bit more, um, or you can even start doing some of that stuff seated so you don't need as much midline because you end up really overextended. Um, lots of like jumping, running, things like that. It's just, especially as the baby gets heavier, that's a lot of like pressure on your pelvic floor every single time. Sit-ups, you just need to come to terms with the fact that you're not going to, like, develop abs while you're pregnant. So there's no point in doing that (laughs) um, at all, actually. So just the earlier that you can take that stuff out, probably the better it's going to be for you in the long run. Um, So, yeah, for me, I base it off of how I feel. Like, yesterday I subbed pull-ups for, like, a supine row um, because hanging from the pull-up bar and even strict pull-ups is already causing some, like, coning for me. But I still feel totally fine doing box jumps with a step down. No problem at all. No peeing, no pressure, no pain in my hips or anything like that. I do get pubic pain when I run right now, so I'm not running. I ran a little bit longer with Knox, but, I mean, any excuse I can use to get out of running, honestly, I'll use. So (laughs) this is just a vacation from that for me for now. And I'll use the bike or do something else. So I would say get with somebody who knows pregnancy. And once again, drop your ego. It's a short period of time. You can do a lot to put yourself into a better position for recovery, or you can do a lot to make your recovery take longer. You can't prevent things like ab separation. That's going to happen. Your belly has to make space for the baby. Um, You're going to probably need to rehab your pelvic floor, no matter what kind of birth you have and things like that. But there are definitely ways to um, 
minimize what you can. So just be smart about it. Um, and then the last question is, what's been the biggest differences between your first and second pregnancy during your first trimester? And I would just say that the exhaustion when you're not a mom is a little easier because you don't also need to take care of your child. And it's not even, I have a lot of help when it comes to Knox. So it's not even that I need to take care of him so, so much because Julian's mom is here and Julian is here, but I want to be with him and I want to be present with him. And I don't want to just be napping all the time while he's awake or, you know, like putting on a movie for him or anything like that. So the biggest difference is just you're, you're exhausted, but being a mom of a two-year-old, like there's no time for your brain to switch off. Like he's still in the like might dart into the street phase. Um, So there's not really any relaxing even at home until he's asleep. And then uh, I think there's more, I think there's more worry before you're a mom. You don't know how special it is to be a mom. At least I didn't, I haven't been around a lot of like babies in my life um, that I've been super close to. So, uh, how special Knox is to me. Um, I didn't realize what that was going to feel like until he came. And now that I know what that is like, and I know it's going to be the same way with the, with the second baby, you're almost like more afraid to lose, to lose it. And things like, like he's, he's a re he's been a real, real person to me since like the moment I got a positive pregnancy test. And it's not that Knox wasn't, but I just didn't really know what that meant. Um, I have been more nauseous. I have been more tired. And then the last thing is just the worry of losing my relationship with Knox, which I've talked about a few times. Um, when I was pregnant with Knox the first time, it was all excitement. Um, there was some fear going on in our relationship because our relationship was so new. But as far as being a mom, that was all excitement. But this time it's like, uh, I'm worried that I'm going to miss Knox and I'm not going to be with him as much or that he's going to get jealous or I'm worried for the new baby that he's not going to get. I mean, Knox has had a lot of attention for almost, you know, for like two and a half years now. And I'm worried that the second baby won't get as much love, that it's just impossible for us to give that much love to when there's two of them around. So those are the biggest differences. Um, but we're excited. We have six months left to go. Uh, less than six months now and um we can't wait to keep sharing the story with you and eventually share our new little guy with all of you so thank you